Good morning, folks. There's a video inside this video towards the end if you've got time. Meanwhile, we're at the tail end of the SDO eclipse season right now, and yesterday was a new moon. Both Earth and Moon eclipsed the satellite yesterday, as we'll see on multiple wavelengths here. If you are new to SDO eclipses, we get them twice a year in terms of the satellite going behind Earth, and almost every new moon, we get a couple there too. Yesterday, it was the new moon making the best display amidst otherwise quiet activity on the surface. Change of motion occurs because the satellite was moving southward over the equator and then laterally across the polar region in its orbit. So we come to spaceweathernews.com and again, apart from the gorgeous SDO eclipses, there wasn't much to see. By the way, you can search online for SDO eclipse and learn more than you'd ever want to know about them. Meanwhile, none of that affects the solar wind, which continued its downward trend in intensity yesterday. Geomagnetic conditions, all quiet. A last quick note on that SDO eclipse, actually. The moon eclipses look fairly defined in a circle, but the satellite is closer to Earth and the atmosphere is thick, so the grainy eclipses are Earth. One of the moon frames caught me yesterday as being very intriguing during that event. The magnetogram for one frame was able to capture both the sun and a piece of the moon. You can see how magnetically their surfaces appear different in the high detail return. And I remembered that the moon has a tenuous atmosphere and ionospheric layers, and so I flipped on the color returns Indeed, we've got alternate polarity shells out there on the periphery of the moon. Folks, this might be the magnetogram's capturing of the thin exospheric layers of the moon for the first time ever. Top seismic event yesterday struck Turkey. While it shook Iran, the damage and deaths occurred westward. Nine dead, dozens of homes collapsed. Locusts are back in the news, this time not in Africa, however, but in India. They seem to be somewhat hungrier than the African swarm. Meanwhile, despite drought and bushfires, the agricultural sector had a banner year in southern Australia, numerous crops seeing a double-digit increase in their yearly totals. Modesto, still no rain, still breaking high records while snow and ice are part of Scotland's wettest February ever, and of course, this is still happening in the United States and it really hasn't even begun in the eastern part of the country yet. A team is investigating the great filter question for our species and hoping it can be answered by finding techno signatures of life in the cosmos. Now, while that is currently a pipe dream, it does bring up the interesting question of whether Earth's catastrophe cycle is our great filter. On the podcast yesterday at our website, we went over the possibility that humans have 12,000 years or so to progress and expand into space before the sun sends us back to the beginning to try it all again. Triple cosmology set here before we get to that video within this video. First, an excellent paper is digging a tunnel through hectares of nonsense to arrive at the conclusion that alphanic activity dominates the auroras, being far more widespread and ubiquitous in the system. This is, of course, critical because alphane's version is not currently mainstream science. It's the plasma cosmology version of magnetic reconnection in particle physics, so a good practice would be that every time you see them say something about how critical alphanic things are to the science, just think to yourself, Birkeland, Alphane, Peratt, Plasma Cosmology. Now we're going to keep with that here, but focusing on the dusty element of the paradigm. It turns out that 90% of all dust ever created in nova stars within galaxies has either been destroyed by light or ejected from the galactic systems. Now, how much of that was destroyed versus ejected into the circumgalactic medium is, of course, one of the most critical questions in galactic astrophysics. The lost light of Hubble and the hidden very hot phase of those media indicate the ejection pathway is preferred. And that brings us to a similar situation, but from a completely different angle. And with a nod to Halt and Arp, they suggest that distance markers to space objects might be off. But in this case, they are pretty convincingly showing that one of the biggest problems, one of the two things causing confusion, is either too high of emissivity in the outer galactic regions, too low of emissivity in the galactic interiors, or most likely, both. Now, emissivity is the ability of something to emit infrared light, so we're talking about dust here, re-emitting the energy it took in as photoionizing light of higher wavelengths. Now, if they're noticing a mismatch in there being too high of emissivity in the outer zone, meaning more dust, and lower emissivity inside, meaning less dust, then we have no choice but to follow the totality of the literature and say that yes, it was probably ejected, not destroyed. It is populating the circumgalactic medium and helping to hide the plasma there too, meaning we don't see everything involved in the galactic dynamics and as our video from a week ago laid out, there is no galactic rotation problem. 
That video is linked below, and it would have been very nice to have these new papers from today when I made that video, but these bombshell releases just after our releases seem to be a thing these days. Now, it's time to request help once again. Thanks to all of your help yesterday, we now know what we have to do in order to get the primary piece of literature in the community properly indexed and its citations captured by Google as well. It is not complicated, but it is time consuming. Here's the story, and shocker, we just have to follow directions. Hey folks, the good news is that many of you came through for us yesterday, and we know what we have to do in order to get the book indexed by Google. The bad news? is that that requires reformatting most if not all of the more than 450 citations in the book. Here is the story of the academically inexcusable and what we're going to do to fix it. I started the list for fun in 2015. Didn't really care about format, it was just for me. Over the years, I encountered different journals using Chicago, APA, and other styles, just copying what they gave or, in many cases, just copying the author's title, journal, and year. Many are missing volumes and page numbers, and pretty much all of them are missing DOI numbers and links to the papers. Sadly, this comes back to bite me, as the proper style format is the last missing piece required for Google Scholar. I can do the rest. So, as boring and tedious as this is, we need to copy the reference information one by one, search and find the papers online, go to those pages and get the appropriate information. Interestingly, the Google system should recognize any of the appropriate and accepted formats, so we can pretty much just copy their desired citation if they give it, which almost all do on these pages. Just in case they don't, it will help if you know some of the acceptable citation styles. And you can either copy their DOI link they provide or copy the URL web address from your browser if they do not provide a DOI. We are remaking the reference list, one by one, keeping the alphabetical order, and yes, it turns out the most painstaking aspect of getting over that Google Scholar hurdle, which will be huge for the community, is at hand. Hopefully, we'll be able to split these up among a number of you to make it easier, but indeed, you likely need to be detail-oriented, and it helps if you know citation formatting, again. Being OCD wouldn't kill you on this one either, but most importantly, it's best if you care. This won't seem much like boring work with the knowledge you are genuinely doing as much to help the future of our community as pretty much anyone in the history of it. I can't believe how simple it is to pull this off, and yet it's one of those easier said than done type situations. There are no permissions, no approvals, no difficulty in the coding that will need to be done. Just a lot of grinding. If you know what I'm asking for here, and you are willing to help tackle this issue this week, please help. Send me an email directly at ben at observatoryproject.com. Folks, we greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind map forecasts and shots of our start to close, and of course, we'll do this all again tomorrow, right here, but right now, it's 4.45 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open, no fear. Be safe, everyone.